Am I back? I think I... In trying to change that, I think I just lost the stream. Uh, so just tell me that we have toast. Okay. Alright, cool. Uh, I don't know what happened. I was just trying to change the game title. But anyway, okay, so... Bennett got locked out. Um, and also we discovered that they were actually playing... Uh, this switch will not work. So this is sort of the... Again, this is sort of a mirror to the first game where we were investigating what happened on the Space Pirate Frigate. In this case, we're investigating what happened to the... Uh, the Galactic Federation Marines. Um, I don't like this plan. The Hive is a small portion of a larger network. There may be dozens of Hive systems like it all across the planet, and they may all be linked. Destroying this one may buy us time, but it may also provoke the other Hives into attacking. So these, these couple of messages are now telling us that the troopers might have been taking the offensive against these bugs. Um, they were trying to bait them into a trap. They were attacking the Hive. And the fact that those splinters go running off into this little tunnel also guides our attention in that direction. Shows us where we can go. Um, and we have another... We have another, um, another dead splinter here. Another Galactic Federation. And again, note that the blue ones don't give us log entries, but the red ones do. Um, computers are telling us that there have been security breaches, but that much is pretty much obvious. And a lot of this is just background information. Uh, it also points out that their attempts to, to get rid of the creatures, um, have failed because, or the attempts to keep out the creatures have failed because the creatures burrow through solid earth. Okay, and now we can see the splinters are trussing these guys up. Um, engineering, I've wanted, restored one of the ship's power cells here, it's holding so far, but too much activity could knock it offline. Um, so we have more splinters here that have been killed by the marines that were apparently burrowing into, into this area. And we also have our first standard, standard issue bomb slot, because, you know, this is how you do it. Um... <laughs> One of the um, because gameplay elements of Metroid. Um, right, so we can use this teaches us to use the bomb jump and also to drop a bomb in these bomb slots to power them. I've got to presume that that is that's like an interface for something else, and you it's using a bomb that just happens to. And man, is that a cool moment. So we'll go ahead and get a scan off one of these enemies. Um, we learn that these are deceased uh, Galactic Federation soldiers. Um, they, are, they have now been possessed by an unknown biomass. Uh, with parasitic tendencies, their armor has been compromised, but the bulk of it remains intact, and their weapon systems remain online. Um... They, but they're basically slow and sluggish because the um, the parasite that is possessing them is still trying to figure out how to work them. Uh, also, I think it tells us that the bomb slot is offline now. They are not actually zombies. But you would be forgiven for thinking that. So this is the game basically saying, well, I hope you figured out the controls because zombies. Uh, and the charge beam can be used to draw in... To, to draw in power-ups like those energy. Uh, the little spheres are, are uh, health, health pickups and the little yellow... 
No, okay, no. Derivan is saying, look, they're they're um they're dead bodies that are animated by parasites, those are zombies. No, that is not a type of zombie, okay? That that is bullshit science fiction because people can't handle the idea of zombies anymore. It's it's people saying, Oh, our zombies are different, you know. No. Zombies are magic. Sorry. And by restoring power, we can now unlock this this gate. By locking on to an enemy, we can strafe back and forth, um, which is our primarily like the first uh, like the first Metroid Prime. This game does not give us too many defensive verbs. Uh, basically, your defensive verbs are dodge and um, dodge and basically take it on the chin. All right, more crates. Uh, and the crates are here to sort of soften the um, soften the tutorial area by giving us ample um, pickups to recharge our missiles and health as we need them. Um, I think the, the the dark troopers will. Uh, uh, okay, I'm gonna. There's a, like a weird fog gate over that door, huh? So we have another, an unknown, whoops, what is this? Uh, cause cardiac arrest due to electrocution. It got stuck in a network of live wires leading from an active power core. Holy shit. Okay. All right. So what we have in front of us now, obviously we saw uh, Dark Samus. Uh, I don't think there's any giveaway in giving her that name. Um, and this is an unknown dimensional anomaly. A dimensional rift. Target destination unknown. I like that the mask can even figure out, well, obviously it's a dimensional rift that goes to another dimension. I'm just not sure which dimension. Um, and Dark Samus fled into it. So, being Samus Aaron, we go and chase after her. Now this is actually a really hard cutscene to parse until you know what's going on in the game. So that blue stuff is Phazon, the mysterious element from the first game, and Dark Samus is doing something with it. And she blasts that crystal, that little crystal beacon that was sitting next to us. And then this hemisphere of light closes in on us. Sorry, my tea was ready. <laughs> Alert, gear stolen by unknown creatures. So we've lost our space jump. We've lost our grapple beam, which we didn't even know we had. We've lost the morph ball boost. Oh, I forgot we had we started with that. We lost our power bombs. We lost our missile launcher. We lost our morph ball bomb. And we do have the remaining system. So basically we have the charge beam and we also have the Varia suit, uh, which was a... The Varia suit was a powered up suit in, in previous games, but now it is just the default suit. 
And now we're left to kind of try and figure out what the hell just happened. And it actually, um, losing your gear like that actually kind of sets up a neat, a neat different mechanic for this game, uh, for regaining your gear. Because obviously it's a Metroid game, we know we're going to regain our gear. Um, and of course right after it takes our Morph Ball Bombs, here's a door that can only be opened by, uh, Morph Ball Bombs. Uh, Taloric Alloy is weak to, to Morph Ball Bombs, so we can't go that way, but we can go this way. Uh, oh, it's also telling us how to do the dodge move. If we tap B quickly and move to the side, we do a little side dodge. It's basically like a, a side hop. This game... Although the first game was obviously an action-adventure game, this game is much more action-oriented. Um, in that it's it's very much more focused on co combats and much more difficult combats. One of the things that, that led to the development of this game, now that we're sort of getting through the, um, through the tutorial area, uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, the game itself. So, Retro Studios was given the chance to make Metroid Prime, uh, basically by Nintendo. It was, which which was actually a really big move at the time. It was, I think, it was the first time that Nintendo actually let um, let a third party studio have have at one of their you know one of their like primary franchises. But at the same time, um, Nintendo hasn't always been super respectful of Metroid because it Metroid doesn't particularly do very well in Japan. It, it always did much better in America. So Metroid Prime actually came out and it was a huge success to the point where um, where Retro Studio where Met blah, 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 Nintendo went back to Retro Studios Retro Studios. And offered them the opportunity to do a sequel. Um, and took the reins off a little more. Because, uh, by the way, this is the other side of that of the purple hologram door that we encountered before. Um, so Retro, Retro Studios was had a lot of oversight from Nintendo uh, for the first game. And they were, let, they were let off the reins a little bit more. And they were allowed to do a little bit more of their own thing with this game. And one of the things they wanted to do was to make it a little bit more um, a little bit more hardcore is actually how they described it. They wanted it to be harder. They um, they wanted to up the action ante basically. And the difficulty level in this game, which you're gonna see what that the difficulty will spike very quickly. Um, so and it was kind of a shock to people. So although this game was received very well, one of the biggest complaints about it was that it was significantly harder than than the previous. I'm assuming that you guys can read the read the scans that you're interested in, but basically what we have is we have an indestructible crate attached to a winch. This is more Galactic Federation stuff. This indicates that they were probably here for a while because they were sort of setting up a work area now. Um, and moving stuff into their underground base. So they were, at this point, they were fighting the indigenous population and they were digging in. Of course, that whole plot starts to take a side, to, starts to go, um, kind of go off to the side as we deal with the other plot of the mysterious Dark Dimension, the strange aliens that stole Samus' suit, and of course, Dark Samus. Um... So now that we sent that crate away, we're not quite sure why we did that, but it'll be important in a minute. We got more Galactic Federation crates. If we scan those little blue things on the wall from a distance, we will see they are splinter cocoons. Once you get close to them, uh, splinters will pop out of them, so you lose your opportunity to scan them. And we have another one of these doors that we can't, we can't activate because we don't know how to translate the alien text and programming. Oh, that's... So see the the splinters come popping out of those cocoons. 
Um, oh, and these are different. These are not worker splinters. These are a little bit more aggressive. These are actual splinters. Um, aggressive and dangerous in numbers. Light armor is no match for your weapons, however. Which, once again, sort of beg, uh, begs the question of why was the Galactic Federation having such trouble with these um, splinters? Oh, Blue Cryo was pointing out that uh, Capcom did Zelda Oracle of Seasons and Ages before this, but yeah, and it was on a smaller scale. And it's actually kind of interesting to, um, I was watching some interviews with the folks at Retro Studios about the development of Prime, and they talked about how heavily involved Nintendo was in sort of teaching their corporate culture, and there was one really interesting incident where, um, uh, basically, uh, I think it was Shigeru Miyamoto, actually, the, the, um, came to, came to their offices, and they're sitting around and they're talking about, um, they're, they're basically just talking about, um, how, I think it was like, you know, how, how, like, how the player would see the world through Samus, how, how to make the player feel like Samus, and Shigeru Miyamoto said something like, something weird, like, well, what would it be like if Samus could take off her head and put on a bug head? And the guys at Retro Studios, they're, they're like, reading this up, oh, we're gonna interrupt for a moment, because we have another, we have another, um, Oh, these are just cocoons filled with nourishment. I'm, I know I'm going through the scans kind of quick, but I'm just trying to call attention to the interesting ones. Like, uh, uh, Private First Class Maroney here. I think Haley's losing it. He talks to himself all the time and he won't sleep. He almost shot me on watch the other night. I think he thought I was one of those things. I talked to the doc about taking him off the line, and he told me we need all the help we can get. That's true, but if he goes berserk and kills a bunch of us, that won't be very helpful. I, I like that one. The the scans in this game, they are much more interesting, and there's a reason for that that I guess I should talk about when I get done with this whole bughead story. So the idea is, you know, he was saying, well, what if Samus could take off her head and put on a bug head? How would that change the game? And they're sitting around, they cannot figure out for the life of them what, what Miyamoto was talking about. And then it kind of sort of hit them of what it would be like if Samus could see through compound eyes. And that evolved into the whole, the visor mechanic in the first game. Um, and, you know, and they said after the fact that, you know, in... An American company, they might have said something like, what if, what if you could just change visors? What if you could have x-ray vision? What if you could see heat? What if you could see in the dark? That sort of thing. But it was just a different way of communicating that, that led them to work out their own problems. Which is actually, I guess, kind of neat. But So this game sort of let them off the hook. Now, of course, we can't get through this red door uh, because we don't have the missiles. Um, and speaking of Nintendo's influence on on the Metroid Prime franchise, or Japan's inf influence on the Prime franchise, another thing that Nintendo was sort of directly responsible for was the scanning mechanic. They really pushed heavily for it, whereas Retro was not particularly enamored of the scanning mechanic. And of all the mechanics in the game, it was one of the least popular with American audiences and the most popular with Japanese audiences. In the first Prime game, all of the scans have a very similar voice, you know, um, that is, they all have this sort of very clinical, clinical tone to them of just delivering data, um, whereas here with the, with the, I mean, the, the Chozo log, the Chozo scans obviously were, you know, the kind of myth, that sort of ancient mythological text sort of thing. I assume I don't have to explain like that. I transported that crate from there to here, um, and then the crate winch got stuck, and I can shoot the crate down, and it makes a platform. So this is sort of our first puzzle of the game, uh, first platforming puzzle, which is we create a way to proceed. The game is also, I think. Uh, let me go back and rescan this red door before I say this, but I think. 
a missile blast may damage it. The game is actually also really good in this instance of telling you through the scan visor what you can't do. We might also notice that the sky is changing um, and the light levels are changing. Like, it will frequently go from a nice clear day to this purple cloud thing and then transition back. Uh, which we also saw a little bit in the opening cutscene. And that's sort of important, too. So here we have... This is actually a collectible scan. This is a, a Mark Seven Galactic Federation gate made of Denzium. And if we're really looking around, we'll actually discover that there's more Denzium in this wall here. And if you listen... You can also hear that sound. That's the sound of the power-ups. So if you're doing all the scavenger hunting to find all the items, um, you listen for that sound and it'll tell you that there's a nearby item. Uh, and now we... Sort of an airlock or a security gate arrangement here. Okay, and now we're we're here moving through these canyons, trying to find. Basically, at this point, we're still trying to find the rest of the of the Galactic Federation Marines. We know that they had a ship that went down. We know that they were taking apart their ship. You can see they're using deck plating to make paths. So they were taking apart their ship to build a staging ground, and we're trying to track them down now. While we wait. Wait for our ship. Uh, so they use Pirate First Class Bruda. So what I was saying about the scans, though, is that these are written in people's voices now. We'll be making our stand here. The engineer tells me there's no way we'll get to the ship's engineer engines online. An atmospheric interference is scrambling our distress beacon. If anyone reads this, know that we did our duty and fought well. So that guy was actually kind of fatalistic. But even in those brief little scans, you get a sense that there were personalities writing that. Uh, like the sort of wry humor that was like, well, the doc said we need all the help we can get, but if he shoots us all, that ain't helpful. You know, sort of that, that wry sarcasm there. And this is where they placed their emergency transmitter, trying to get a signal out because their ship had been damaged. And as we activate it, transmission failed due to atmospheric interference. So we cannot get a signal off of this planet. Uh, and we've got a few more dark troopers here. Um, and also, if, if you pay attention, you'll notice that sort of black and purple um, necrotic cloud effect. So this is an interesting spot, too, because that the gun turret will... So that's an automated marine, uh, Federation Marine turret. It will target us, but it will also take out the splinters. It's actually a Growler-class turret. I guess it takes a couple of hits, huh? There we go. And it, I believe that one will always spawn a pickup just to make sure that you have learned um, that you can draw in pickups. Which was similar. There was a couple of missile turrets um, in, the, in the pirate frigate that also did that. This also introduces us to a rule that our scans will not work through even transparent objects, um, which will become a major screw job later. But fortunately, we find this. And so far, you'll notice the game is also really very linear. Oh, okay, this is uh, I, SPC. I'm not sure what SPC is. Specialist? I don't know. I don't know my military ranks. But this is Angseth, and she's actually a really cool one. This is ridiculous. I can outshoot half the men here, and I'm stuck on monitor duty. I didn't join up to stare at a hollow screen. This wouldn't happen to Samus Aaron. She'd be out there taking care of business, not pushing buttons and sending reports. 
So I kind of like, Angseth, there's actually another scan too that, that kind of addresses Angseth's hero worship for Samus. Um, and you sort of get the sense that she was the girl on the team. Uh, and that maybe she didn't, she didn't quite get the respect she deserved because of that. Uh, Mad Adventure is confirming that uh, SPC is specialist. Um, and this gate, by the way, is broken. It will continue bouncing up and down, and then it will eventually stop and be closed forever. Uh, so if we want to get through it, we're going to have to use high-yield explosives. In general, this game is really good at pacing, at building up the story. Um, and it's going to be done with the story shortly for a while. Because now we find... The Galactic Marine Federation ship. Or the Galactic... The, the Marine ship. I don't know why I keep insisting on the whole Galactic Federation thing. And here we get the story of what happened. I like that they're the Heracles, but it's misspelled. Friggin' space pirates again! It's always space pirates! I do kind of resent that the, um... That the uh, Galactic Federation Marine Corps gets to use the same theme... Uh, a takeoff on Samus Aran's... The Samus Aran's theme song. Until they appeared. <laughs> Mad Adventure saying, who's filming this cutscene? Ship sensors! Now, if you're very attentive, you'll notice that those splinters are different from the splinters we fought, and they're also exploding in that same black and purple cloud. See, and the other thing is, like, I like that touch that Samus closes his eye and then she bows his head for a moment. Uh, or she bows her head for a moment uh, in regret. Because it sort of humanizes her. It, t it takes away that fact that she's basically a robot. Um, which is... It's, it's really interesting because... People say when, when Metroid Other M came out that, you know, Samus had never been given a voice and a personality before and Other M was the first game to do that. But I would argue that the Prime series actually gave her a lot of personality, as did Fusion. Um, it was just done in different ways. And in fact, Samus did have a few speaking lines in, at the end of Fusion when she was arguing with the, with the AI. So here we get uh, Captain Exeter's log. Um... Where he says, I'm beginning to think it was a bad idea going down there. Reeves is right. That hive is one of many. It's stupid to stir a hornet's nest, especially if you plan on sleeping under it. Eventually I will finish playing Other M, and then we're going to talk about why a lot of what it did was actually sort of defensible, though. Um, I, I'm sort of... One, once I finish it, I have this feeling that I'm going to end up being sort of an Other M apologist to the upset of many. 
Um, and we're going to end up with the rest of... So this is Brood. This is the guy who almost shot the other guy. I think... No, no, no. Man, I hope that this is the only breeding ground for those things. If there's more, we're in big trouble. We had a hard enough time taking that one out of commission. I almost ran out of ammo, and I never run out of ammo. <laughs> There's a, I think there's another trooper here who says even Brode ran out of ammo. Uh, so oh, this is Haley. Um, I hear them. Oh, Haley is the one who almost shot the guy, and we can see why because yeah, I hear them everywhere. They're coming. Can't sleep ever. They'll eat me. Eat. Milligan. Um, Bruda lost the bet, so he switched watch duty with me. I figure this section is nice and safe and boring, which suits me just fine. Let those other pugs guard the hot zone. I Hold on, hey, wait, no, help. Um, O-Dog is saying, when did they have the time to write these logs? And based on the way that one ended, I think these are actually audio records. Otherwise, he actually typed out, wait, no, what was that help? Why, why would he carve Og? <laughs> the Sarge says those splinters remind him of some killer bug he saw on another planet once. All I know is the things are fast and take a lot to drop. Pretty soon we'll have to go to bayonets. Everyone's low on ammo, even Brode, and he's the stingiest grunt I know. Yeah, there's... The, there's the reference to uh, Brood. Uh, and we also have this Super Crate. Um, which is... This is a Galactic Federation Ordnance Crate. Um, personal weapon inside, yada, yada, yada. Notice that it's big and glowy and bright and set out on its own and very hard to miss. And that is because it contains our first power-up. A missile launcher. So now we have... I, I don't want to say we've recovered our missile launcher. Um, and <laughs> triggered by the fact that we got a new weapon, we encounter our first dark splinters. So these are these are insectoid predators. These are splinters that have been possessed by an unknown alien symbiote, which has raised its strength and durability. The same thing that's possessing the corpses of the pirates um, has also possessed these these bugs. And they are a little bit more powerful. They take two power shots to take down. Uh, and they are a little bit faster. And you can see what I mean too about this game being a little bit more action oriented. These areas are bigger. There's more room to maneuver than the, than the areas in Prime. Um, Matt the Wobo said, I assume that the TMNT jokes were all made before I got here. No, actually, nobody has made the turtle, the Ninja Turtles jokes yet. And we have another door whose alien text we can't translate. Um, this one's green. <laughs> uh, and then we can actually go inside the Galactic Federation ship. Uh, this, this is a pain in the ass because I'm so obsessive about scanning but basically this is just a list of where everybody sat on the crew deck of the ship here um and this is also handily enough it's a list of the people who we can of the troopers whose scans we can oh angseth was it was communications she was a communications specialist interesting i think that's uh squad leader Oh, dog is saying, I assume all the doors they shoot to open. Pretty much, except they say it in a little bit more detail. Um, and now we can access the nav computer here in the ship. Um, and get a map of the rest of the area here. So interestingly enough, we've actually now sort of resolved the plot line of the, um, of the Federation Marines. Um, yep. They all got killed by these by these splinter bugs, the dark splinters. Um, there are no survivors, and they couldn't get a distress signal out. So that's the captain and the pilot. 
uh, and we can use the ship kind of to get out, get up onto this platform here. And now, <laughs> I think this is the first, um, oh, so this thing used to contain hollow projectors, um, which indicates that the indigenous species was actually technologically advanced, um, which we're going to find out, um, they're a lot different than the Chozo, even though they are the Chozo. So this is a kinetic orb cannon. This is pretty much the stupidest thing ever. And I can't, I honestly can't defend this. It's, it is utterly ridiculous. It is a device that only exists on the assumption that there, that there is someone who can roll into a ball in the universe. Um, the, this was built by the indigenous species, not the space marines, by the way. Um, and it's used to propel, uh, basically propel uh, spheres or orbs at high speed. Um, and we can now, we note that red doors with the blast shields, a missile blast will damage it. But before we do that, we can go through this little morph ball tunnel here. Yellow doors as they, shit, I fell. Uh, yellow door is weak to power bombs. So we need, we need an upgrade before we can get in there. Now we got to go back around. And at this point, the, the whole Galactic Marine mystery was basically the game's tutorial. Drawing us into the, drawing us into the game, teaching us various gameplay elements. Um, and now, now the game is going to gradually, gradually um, kind of let us off the leash. But not quite so much as in previous games as we're going to see. Because Retro did start to make some changes to the theme of this game. You know, one of the first ones I said, like I said, was that they were trying to make it more hardcore and action-oriented. And you can see we've now found all of Force One. Uh, all of the uh, all of the Galactic Federation troopers from Force One. This is Craney. Last night at Chow, Engseth starts talking about some bounty hunter and how she blew up a planet full of space pirates. Uh, I told her I didn't believe in fairy tales like that, and she took it personal. I just find it hard to believe that one person took out an entire space pirate base, that's all. But if she wants to believe in this Samus or Bigfoot or, Sa Bigfoot or Santa Claus, she can. <laughs> Bigfoot and Santa Claus canonical in the, in the, um, in the, in the space, it's, uh, Star, what the hell, Metroid Universe. And this is the last trooper of Force 2, who is nowhere near where Force 2 was. Um, I'm the only one left. I managed to get out of the hive, but when I got to the ship, everyone was gone. Dead. I'm heading for that alien building we saw earlier. Maybe someone can help me there. Wait, something's moving down there. Hello? Yeah, I probably shouldn't have put that little funny spin on it, but... So that is based, that last scan is the confirmation that you know there is no hope for the Marines. That that mission is over. Um, and in theory, we could just get up and fly away now, except for the fact that our ship was damaged in the storm, and we've got to wait for its self repair functions to work. Uh, meanwhile, the the war wasps. And their their scan is not particularly interesting. It says that they're wasps that can shoot stingers. Um. And those are actually the same war wasps as from from Talon Four. I don't know why they evolved here as well, but whatever. Uh, and these are actually crates. These are alien crates that contain supplies and pickups and things. So by shooting them, we can get power ups. And now we can... Okay, and now... I think if we... Uh, we can't quite look up and see it. But we are in the shadow of a very, very large structure in the sky. Oh, oh there it is. Yeah, okay, so you can see kind of this... Uh, and those are the War Wasp Hives. Uh, similar to in the original game. 
uh, in Prime 1. You take them out with a missile, otherwise they keep spawning war wasps periodically. And that just tells us that now it's destroyed. Uh, we also see this wall. Uh, explosive damage will weaken it. And we can weaken it, but we can't quite destroy it. Mad Adventurer says, so we can just go stand next to our ship now and um, wait for the ship to repair itself, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that, that ain't Samus Aran's way, man. You know that. Because, by the way, I mean, the other thing is that Samus lost all her shit. Like, the, the, the weird black aliens from the black and purple dimension and Dark Samus took away all her gear. Uh, so... So the reason we weakened that wall was so that we can blast through it with the kinetic orb cannon. If we hadn't shot a missile at it first, um, we wouldn't be able to go through it. We'd just bounce off. And then we can use this little... Uh, Use this little tunnel here to get up onto this high ledge. We can take out. And without the space jump, we can't yet get onto that platform in the middle. So we're seeing a lot of areas that we can't quite get to yet. Which is sort of standard for Metroid. You know, it shows us these areas. And we also see this guy. Our first Luminoth. The target has been dead for eight cycles, however long a cycle is. Trace amounts of unknown chemical present in target. It has an effect sim similar to mummification on dead biomatter. Further analysis required to determine chemicals' effect on living biomatter. So, <laughs> again, it's like, you know... Says, so, yes, listen, um, this guy's got chemicals in his body that mummified him. I don't know what they do to living people, but I would need it. Alright, so let's go inside now. And now we find... Find an elevator. And let me tell you, the Luminoff, they built some serious friggin' elevators. I mean, that, that is a fucking elevator right there. An elevator with jump jets. That's how you do it. Okay, and we've got more Luminoth. They've all been dead for, you know, between 8 and 10 cycles. Um, and what we find is that there's actually notes indicating that they went out fighting. Okay, like I said, I'm not, we're not going to pay attention to absolutely every scan unless it's it's super interesting these friggin bats you can cut you can get a scan on them now i mean we'll have another chance to get them later but they fly by really fast so it's tough to get a good scan off of them <laughs> um the cables are here to clue you into this um clue you into this little morph ball tunnel since it's been a while since you saved um, so that's a, that is a save station. That's our, sh our home away from the ship. Um, and this is bombable rock, but we can't bomb it just yet. And if you listen, you'll hear the, the sound of, um, you'll hear the sound of the, uh, a power up in this room that we can't get at yet. So one of the, uh, I think I mentioned that um, Retro wasn't really fond of the scanning mechanic and kind of put it in on sufferance. So one of the things they wanted to do was they wanted to treat it like more of a collectible, uh, kind of a scavenger hunt thing, which is which is why they ultimately and you can see that very clearly in the in the way they designed the percentages to tell you your progress. Oh, okay. We can't we can't scan what's going on here until we walk in because the you can't scan across the trigger of a cutscene is the thing. It's just it is a known limitation of scan visors. And once we walk into the middle of the room, we are isolated by this elect by the force field, and we have to fight more dark splinters.
and we sort of start to see the process now that that this this dark symbiote emerges from these dimensional rifts and possesses creatures and turns them into dark creatures. It powers them up. Um, and it makes them. It, they take more damage and they deal more damage. It usually gives them some enhanced abilities too. Um, you actually there are spots where you have opportunities to kill creatures before the possession takes hold, which is pretty cool. But for the most part, um, at this point, the game is it's just you're gonna you fight um, you're gonna fight dark creatures and you're gonna fight normal creatures, and that's just a part of the game. Uh, and now we encounter our Alpha Splinter, the first mini boss of the game. Uh, Alpha Splinter, Alpha Male of the War, war Pack, Gigantic Predator, um, yada yada yada. It's it's a big splinter. So he stands. Ah shit! I fucked that up. So he stands in the middle of the room, and then he jumps at us. And we're supposed to be using the side dash to. Um, I think I'm standing too far away from him. Is the problem? Yeah. And now he becomes possessed and he becomes the dark alpha splinter. And now he's actually the boss fight. Once you do enough damage to him, he gets possessed by the alien symbiote. Um, he develops that sort of spitting ability. And one of the things that they were nice about is that they have now... Oh, shit. Oh, I'm out of missiles. That's why they're not going off. This is where the game is saying, I hope you figured out the dodge mechanic, because if not, then fuck you. <laughs> there we go. Alright, not so bad. It is actually... That is a tough fight, honestly, because you have so little health to start with. You have 99 health. And and the monsters in this game do hit kind of hard. Um, and now, mad the glow happens. Um, unknown technology. <laughs> this, uh, this glow ball is unknown technology. Um, all we know about it is that if we want to get out of these, uh, out of this force field, we're going to have to t walk into the unknown technology. So we absorb the technology. It's actually neat, too, that uh, the music for acquiring a non-Chozo, non-Battlesuit power-up is different from the normal item-acquire music that, that is so iconic to the Metroid series. Uh, and we ran a virus scan on it. Whatever we got, it's okay. Even though it came from that weird dark virus. Or that weird dark monster. Um, these are high, basically they're cryosleep chambers. Uh, there are living creatures suspended in stasis in these chambers here. And all around this room, uh, all of our ways out, including the way we came in, are, projected, are protected by more of these doors whose alien text we can't translate. Um, so there's only one way forward at this point, and that's this door. Which leads us to this elevator. One of the neat things about uh, the architecture and the, the the graphic design in this game is that it is much more alien than the um, than the 
than Metroid Prime 1. In Metroid, in the first Metroid Prime, um, basically you had the Chozo areas, which looked like ancient temples, and, you know, except for the fact that the statues were of bird people, they, they were just ancient temples like you would expect to see anywhere. And then you had the sort of Z-Rust, crappy, sci-fi technology of the Space Pirates, and that was pretty much it. Though You know, those were the two environments. Here, everything is very obviously alien and weird and built around very different aesthetics. All these weird, glowy bubbles and dots and things. And now we meet Umas, Sentinel of the Luminoth. So I'm going to go slow so that you can read the text if you want. <laughs> and then Ganon invaded from the dark world <laughs> Darabim is asking Phazon I don't know could be <laughs> we did see some phase on already. Also, it's spelled with a Z. <laughs> and this is where things get kind of weird. <laughs> I mean, the whole thing is kind of weird, but. Okay, I guess I won't shoot you. Actually, the, the design aesthetic of the, the Umas is actually really cool because they're very clearly moth people um, who are attracted to the light, and it fits with this game's whole theme of light and dark. I, I really love the feathery antennae and sort of the furry chests. Uh, and this is the translator. Okay, so now we speak Violet. Um... <laughs> the game sort of is a little bit more unapologetic in its railroading, and we'll talk about why it does that too. Because I did promise that we were going to discuss um, we were going to discuss all of the uh, design choices that were made in this game for better or for worse but i'm also trying not to give anything away if you haven't played this game until until you've seen seen it so return to me once you've restored the energy okay uh so umas is a scan Indigenous sentient species of planet Ether. <laughs> the chat is making fun of the fat. And this is, by the way, an energy controller. Um, basically, uh, yeah, well, I guess we'll talk about what the Luminoth did. But, yeah. And finally, in addition to the doors that have different holograms, we also now get these lore projectors. Uh, this one is this one is written in violet, the the language of the purple. 
Um, and it begins telling us the story of the history of of uh, planet Ether. It is told that the Luminoth were not born of Ether, but of the star. Yeah, it's not real. I'm not going to lie. It's not really super interesting. But basically, the Luminoth were a spacefaring race. Um, they ran into other races, including the Chozo, and the Chozo had, you know, and decided that they needed a planet to settle down on, and they, they landed on Ether and started building their civilization there. So, if you didn't feel like reading all of that, and you want the cliff notes of the story, a giant meteor came from space and smashed into, um, smashed into Ether. It started spreading some sort of weird, dark energy across the planet, and ultimately the planet schismed into two different dimensions, normal ether, which we're on now, and dark ether, which became home to the Ing, which were like an evil anti-Luminoth race. Um, the Luminoth had built these energy controllers to, to gather and distribute all of the various energy that they created on the planet. Um, and the, the, um, the Ing started stealing the planetary energy so that Ether would die and be replaced by Dark Ether. Um, in order to steal it back, the Luminoth developed this device called the Energy Collector. Um, but it was stolen by the Ing. Um, yeah, and then... Uh, when Samus killed that one Ing, or that one Dark Splinter, she became bonded to the energy controller, and she can now go into, um, she can now go into, um, Dark Ether, steal back the planetary energy. The planetary energy is focused at three specific temples across the planet. Um, so basically the mission is go into the different regions of Ether. Locate the temple there, or locate the temple in the dark world, steal back the planetary energy, and then bring it to the light world temple, uh, and uh, then move on to the next region. Okay, and now with the um, with the power of being able to speak purple, we can now open purple gates, purple coated gates, uh, and that brings us back out onto this plaza, which we were. This is an area. This is the area with the crane that we passed through before. And look, oh, there's that crate again. I thought I scanned it again. And now we have more dark splinters, or more splinters, I should say. Um, and these are ones that we can kill before they get possessed. Um, They do gain they do gain a little bit of cutscene immunity while they're being possessed. Uh, Matt the Warbo is asking how many how much planetary energy do I have to retrieve? Uh, there are a total of three three energy collectors that have to be restored at three different temples. And then of course, you know, then the boss of the game. And now we have earned our first energy tank. So the game uses the, the color-coded holographs to sort of corral us toward the different areas. Um, that it want, well, I know I'm going crazy a second. I, I bent over for my, for my remote control for a second. I needed to adjust the volume. Sorry. So the game uses the, the different color-coded gates. And by the way, we can't do anything with this crystal yet. This is one of the moving statues. Um, and those are the green crawlies again. So now we're moving back the way we came. Um, because we're going to head to our, to the first, uh, geographic region of this game, which is dark, uh, uh, the Aegon Wastes. Uh, I believe that according to the story, Aegon was once this... Uh, uh, someone in the chat pointed out that I missed the scan, by the way. Thank you. Um, which is, which is good. So we're going to head to Aegon, which was once, um, basically it was lush, lush farmland 
uh, until the, the cataclysm, the meteor struck. Um, and now we can translate this door, con this door here. Once fertile plains, now sand scorched and ruined by war. May life thrive again there once more. Unlike the Chozo, who were all about peace and living in concert with nature, the Luminoth were much more into technology and into combat, as we're going to see. Um, this game has some of the need... Aegon Waste is kind of dull, but this game has some of the neatest um, areas... Uh, neatest zones in the game, uh, in any of the Metroid games. Arthur HS is asking, are there scans you can miss for good? And the answer is yes, there are, uh, particularly your bosses. And what we're going to find out is that many of the bosses actually have multiple scans. Okay, so this is the final entry uh, from Warrior Jaif Meh. Their army swells, beasts and rogue machines join the ranks of the Horde, all eager to bring death to the Luminoth. The Ing sent these new additions to the industrial site to do battle with me. While they watch from safety, cowardly mo while they watch from safety, cowardly mongrels, my only regret in death is that I did not leave to see the day of their defeat. May it come soon. Now we don't quite know yet what why this luminoth is special why he is one of the one of the cadre of key bearers and specifically why it why it calls attention to industrial site um but that is actually the name of the room that we are in and all of those highlighted things um are when they highlight a word in the key bearer lore, it is referring to, to a specific room location. Um, and we'll see later on why that's important. Uh, and there's there's actually a couple of things. So this is the elevator to Aegon Wastes. Another thing that got added to this game, by the way, is death is falls that will kill you. But they don't actually kill you. They take off 10 health and then put you back on the ledge that you fell off of. Um, but here, outside of this cliff, if you don't come out and enjoy the view, you'll never see it. But this is a scan that is particularly hard to find. <laughs> Terrible says Samus must have some serious OCD. Wait, its chitin is a slightly different color. I must update my log. It's trying to kill you! Uh, Luminoth lore. Again, this is the history of the planet. Our search for a home took us through the cosmos. Many a great cycle we roamed. Uh, oh, okay. Scout returned. We really liked the look of Aether, so we built our um, so we built our civilization there. Feel free to rewatch this later and um, slow it down so you can read this, the scans. Uh, also, we've got one more of those webbing things, and that protects our first missile expansion. Uh, like the first game, there are missile expansions and energy tanks scattered throughout the game. The energy tanks themselves tend to be a lot easier to find in this game um, for a very important reason. They kind of had to be, as we're going to discover. The missile tanks are hidden. Uh, some of the missile tanks, you have to jump through some ridiculous hoops to get some of the missile tanks in this game, or the missile expansions. But the energy tanks, we're going to find that the game kind of tries to get get us to find as many of them as we can um and shortly we're going to find out why because there there's a certain point before which i'm not stopping um because it introduces the other major mechanic of this game uh so that's the elevator and now that we're in Aegon, uh every area of the game has its own form of crates so in Aegon, the crates are these little desert plants um, that you can blow up and they will generate health and missile pickups. And here we have Lumites. And I'm just scanning. Like I said, I will call attention to the interesting scans. Um, but, you know, the individual creature stuff just isn't super, super interesting. But I do want 100% it. Oh my god, I never... Um, judging by the number of wounds, the tar target was dead long before the desert got to it. This game is really obsessed with telling us. Uh, Darabim is asking, do you have to scan energy tanks and missile expansions? No, not in this one. They're not, they're not log entries. Um, 
creatures are log entries. Um, most me most useful mechanisms are log entries, and objects that you can interact with with Samus's various power ups, like uh, like spider ball tracks and things. Those are those are required scans. So now we actually come out into Aegon Wastes proper. Darabim says 1.1 deca cycles. Seriously, seriously, we can't just say 11 cycles. Hey, now they're on the metric system. Um. So this is the Aegon wastes. Uh, pretty harsh, unforgiving terrain. And here we get our our sand digger, which is basically a double-headed centipede. Um, the eye, it has, its eye will glow at either end. Um, it is only vulnerable at one end at a time. Um, and we get our first missile door. We, I mean, we can explore this area a little bit. Not our first missile door. But. Yeah, see, no, see how he kind of switched eyes on me? Um, this game is also obsessed with glowing weak points. And I mean, I know a lot of video games like to play the glowing weak point game. This game is full of glowing weak points. And glowing weak point juggling and glowing weak point... We're, we're, I actually... I think... One of the reasons that I like this game more now is that I have become much more a fan of action games than I was when I when I was younger. Um, and this game definitely puts a lot of action and challenge into the combat. So these are sand bats. These are the same creatures we saw in the temple. And this is the, the Aegon save point. Now, unlike in Metroid Prime where we kept going sort of back and forth between the different areas that were all sort of tightly interconnected and there were multiple ways between the different areas. What we're going to find in this area, in this game, is that we tend to spend most of our time in one area and then move on to the next. We will occasionally backtrack to a previous area, but for the most part, the, the game is structured for us to complete one area before before we move on to another. So, what I'm saying is get used to Aegon Wastes for a while. Okay, and we can roll up this path uh, and get a scan on these blue root trees. Um, the other thing is that these, you might notice these trees and that they're not really here, they're sort of ghosts. There's a lot of stuff in this game that is in sort of a state of being stuck between dimensions as a side effect of the whole um, schisming of the planet into two different dimensions. And we have this missile pack here, but we can't get at it just yet because it's protected by that blast shield. So we really can't go in this direction yet, but that's okay. Remember that like most Metroid games, or like all Metroid games, this game does have a critical path that it sort of tries to keep us gently on without without making it feel like we don't actually have a say. So it let us explore a little while until we hit a dead end, and then we're like, okay, well, we'll go back in another direction. So we feel self-directed, but at the same time, the game is corralling us in the direction that it wants to go. Okay, and where it really wants us to go, because right now all we can do is we can make these jumps along this ledge and sort of loop around here and blast some crates. Um, the game is also good at determining what you need. So if your health starts to get low, crates will generate more health pickups. If your missiles start to get low, they will generate more uh, missile pickups and so on and so forth. Um, we can use a missile to break this pillar and then these sand bats sort of circle around it 
and we can blast them so they don't knock us off. And now we have another holographic lore projector, but uh oh. Um, it's yellow, and we don't speak yellow yet. We only know purple. We haven't learned yellow. Um, and I think right below me, there is also, yeah, there is a door. There is a yellow translator door, but we can't go there yet. We also see this weird blue kind of cutout space in the wall here on the other side of this gate. We, you can never get through this gate. This gate is permanent. But, um, but yeah, just take note of this weird blue... Um, I think I, there was one Let's Play of this game where they kept referring to it as Blueberry Cobbler. Um, whatever. Just take note of that for now. It, it actually tells you something. Uh, it tells you something is there. Um, this thing is, what the hell is it? Uh, purpose unknown, placed as a warning to travelers. <laughs> Couldn't have a sign? Um, and this is part of a Luminoth sonic security system. These are solar lenses as part of a sonic security system. And it actually does make sense when you... Um, Arthur HS is saying you, you would think that a Chozo scanner that intuits scientific information about, um, about, uh, complex bioorganisms would be able to decode encryptions. Uh, Mad Adventure is asking if I watch other video game Let's Plays. Yeah, uh, Guilty as Charged. I actually, um, th only a few. I gotta say I'm very picky about what let what Let's Plays I will watch. Um, they either have to be really funny or really informative. Um, so like, um, there was this guy, Simply Simon, and he did these absolutely fantastic Let's Plays of all the Mega Man games. Um, and he really picked the games apart in a lot of detail, which was fantastic. Um, and I love, uh, Slow Beef and Diabetes. Um, they have their own channels, but they, they work through, um, Retsu Prey. Um, which originally started, Slow Beef, um, it was a Something Awful member, um, who, he basically kind of invented, I, I, I don't know if it's right to say invented, because there were a few instances where people had done it beforehand, but he was the first, first one to really take video of video games and attach commentary to it. This was before streaming, so he would, you know, you would pre-record the video and then... Did I scan one of these space pirates? By the way, space pirates. I did not. Okay, so these are space pirate troopers who you might recognize from the first game, and it also uses the theme song from the first game, so that it's playing the, pirate, the space pirate leap motif. Now, we knew pirates had already been foreshadowed because, um... The, the Galactic Marines had been chasing a pirate ship. Um, and that's when they crashed on this planet. But um, the pirates... Yeah, okay, so the, the, the space pirates strangely dislike theft thing. It's, it's sort of a weird remark. I think it, the, the word was, shouldn't have been strangely, but ironically. The idea is the space... The, basically, whenever you do a scan of... Um, when you scan the uh, crates, it is trying to explain why you have to blast them open. So what it tells you is that basically the crates are locked and impossible to get into. You have to shoot them open. And so for the space pirate crates, the line is, uh, pirate, space pirates, strangely enough, they dislike theft. So you have to blow their crates open because they keep them locked. And I think that the phrase that they were actually looking for there was ironically... Because it's not weird at all that the pirates would, you know, not like, you know, oh, you know, pirates would be okay with you stealing their stuff. Well, no, they wouldn't. Nobody wants you to steal their stuff. Arthur HS is saying that the design of this game feels very dark and gritty, very Man of Steel. And that is true. There, there is, this is a very dark, gritty, grim um, sort of, sort of Metroid it, it's definitely playing up some of the, the horror elements, like, you know, um, possession and um, dark forces, that kind of a thing. Um, 
but the the design of the levels is actually also really like I said they were really going to make it feel they wanted to make it feel like an alien planet so we've got the oh wait I forgot about this so we've got this big temple type space and we can't really proceed in this direction no, I don't. No, Imperial Star Destroyer is saying, it, wouldn't it be hypocritically angry? And no, I don't think it's hypocritical of pirates not to want their stuff stolen. Um, because they, there's not really a, a value judgment in that. It's just they want to possess their stuff. You know, it's just about possession. And they believe that possession is nine tenths of the law. So if you can hold on to your, your property, it is yours. It is entirely in keeping with pirate. So what we see here is we have a bomb slot, by the way, that is in a state of dimensional flux. It does not fully exist in this universe. Um, <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll come back to what that means later. But we also find that, this is, that there is a sand-powered solar energy doohickey in this room. And we don't know yet what it does. Uh, that's telluric alloy we know is stuff we can bomb. Uh, and we do see this this doohickey here. And this will tell us um, console used to energize and open a portal to dark ether currently offline. Um, so there's that. There's also hidden back here another easy to miss Luminoth lore projector. Unfortunately, it's written in yellow. Uh, actually, I should. I'm sorry. The, the correct uh, name for that language is it is amber. Um, so the languages are violet, amber, cobalt and emerald <laughs> there's four there's four different colors and the game actually does tell you um that i've now taught you the language of cobalt so you can you can uh which is by the way a kind of blue um and fun fact cobalt chloride is one of the chemicals used to make blue fireworks look blue uh so there you go uh let's see we also meet these little guys brisgies brisgies are Resilient to gunfire, you have to blast their shells off with um, blast their shell off with a uh, with a missile. Uh, so we we're gonna have to keep exploring this room. We got some more wasp hives, which we'll just go ahead and take out. Ah, I missed that jump. Damn it. Uh, meanwhile, Matt the Warbo is still making computer language jokes. Um, start, he started with the idea the, with st uh, stuff about how yellow is uh, Unicode or ASCII or some shit like that. I don't know. And now, now they're talking about cobalt, 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 um, all sorts of stuff. Oh, Cobalt was the uh, planet from the... Was, that's where the Olympian gods live in Battlestar Galactica, which I've been watching and um, I'm sort of rapidly starting to cool on, I'm going to tell you. It's um, it's kind of grim dark and it, it's got tone issues, I think. But that aside... But this is, by the way, a statue of Deter, the child hero of Aegon, a lowly acolyte squire who became a warrior when the temple was attacked. Um, yeah. And this is a sand gate. Um, and that is the controller for the sand gate, because, of course, we've got to have three different scans for, this whole, for the whole gate component thing. Well, wow, I hit it without actually being locked onto it. Uh, and we have another one of these bridges. Um, Alright, so now we'll go in this direction. This is one of those... This is a scan that's actually kind of hard to get. Um, it's these little... Whoops, I'm stuck in a, an interdimensional tree. But here are Shriek Bats. Um... Uh, so basically, their primary defense mechanism is, is to dive at you and explode. Um, that's how they protect themselves from predators, is to blow up and die. Um, which was kind of a theme in, in Metroid, because those are creatures, actually those are creatures that go back to the original Metroid. Um, and now we find ourselves here, 
in uh, th those are just blocks we can break so we're in kind of this big open circular space that looks nothing like a boss arena um and we can sort of walk around the outside we encounter this white white door oh <laughs> Matt Barbaro noted that the, the scanner tells you that they're terrifying you read the scans fast man by the way um Light energy may damage it, by the way. So um, we're, you're starting to see this the, the light-dark dichotomy get a little bit... Yeah, I'm not... I'm, you know, I obviously can't hide the whole light and dark... Light-dark, light-dark, light-dark thing in this game. Um, so let's walk in... Let's walk blithely into this big, wide-open space that certainly wouldn't make a great boss fight. Uh, and now we have... An alpha sand digger. Basically a giant version of the sand digger that we already fought. Um, and it basically works the same way. Um, whichever end of it is vulnerable is vulnerable. But uh-oh. Oh my god. Who, who could have seen it coming? It's now... It got an art redesign. It got darker and grittier. And now it is the Bomb Guardian. Bomb dropping Darkling. Enemy is utilizing your Morph Ball Bomb Unit. And I actually really like this, um, this mechanic. Uh, and by the way, it's now explaining to us how to fight the creature. So basically, um, when its ass is glowing, we, we shoot it in the ass to stun it. And then we shoot it in the mouth to damage it. And then it'll occasionally vomit forth a fountain of bombs. A fusillade of bombs. So shoot it in the back. Obviously it tries not to let you get behind it. Um, and if you take too long to shoot it in the mouth, it will launch that, as I said, the, the fusillade of bombs. It's actually pretty patternized. Derogum is putting forth the theory that when you beat this boss, you might get your bombs back. I don't know if I was tech... Like, I'm pretty sure that I didn't clear the back of its head that time. Um, also you'll notice when you, when you shoot enemies, uh, they will flash different colors. When they flash yellow, that means you're not damaging them, but you are doing something to stun or weaken them in some way, or to expose a weak point. Um... And this sort of introduces one of the gimmicks of the game is that unlike um, in other Metroid games where you sort of find these statues that had all your items in them, uh, in this game, the, the Ing have taken all the technology they stole from your suit and are spreading it throughout their creatures. So you encounter creatures that have been empowered with your technology. Um... Which is really neat, because the other thing is that there is... You will also find power-ups that are not Chozo technology. Um, because we will be finding some Luminoth technology, which sort of integrates itself into the suit. And there's some interesting things the game does with those, with those mechanics. But now with, with our bombs, we can proceed... And the music that you're hearing now is actually, um, so now we hear, here's a door that, um, dark energy may open this door. Yeah, um, so yeah, dark energy, light energy, might we be getting be different beam weapons? Who's to say? So with the bombs, we can now come in this direction, and, oh, I guess I should scan the, the bomb slot doohickey right 
so this is the bomb slot doohickey, and the bomb slot will give us access to the to Aegon Temple. I don't know why that's scannable. Oh, because it's a statue of Kachik. Katich. Uh, all all Luminoth, by the way, have the same structure for their names. One consonant, a hyphen, and then three other consonants or vowels. Um, and this is... This is the energy controller of Aegon. Which is currently empty of energy. Even though it says it holds a selection of several types of energy, including solar, bio, and geothermal energy. So the, um, so the Luminoth were a green green energy operation um and this is where once we get the energy back from the dark Aegon temple we bring it back here to put it in the light Aegon energy temple thing we also find a dead luminoth damage from multiple weapon systems detected subject definitely went out fighting and he left an amber hollow beacon with an automated message in it. He is Isha, Sentinel of the Aegon Temple. Uh, so a portal to Dark Aether lies nearby. With it you can travel to this land's shadow. You must locate a dark temple, a twisted mockery of this sacred place. Inside you will find the energy controller you seek, which was already kind of explained to us. But here's the other half of this. Bing, bing, bing. The temple door, the dark Aegon temple door, is held fast by three locks. The keys for the locks are hidden throughout the dark land. Okay. Your search will be difficult. Even the very air of dark ether is dangerous and can cripple the strongest of warriors. In our past struggles with the Ing, we placed a series of light crystals throughout the world they remain today. These crystals create safe areas that will protect you from the harmful atmosphere of the Dark World. It is kind of interesting that the game is, is just giving you the exposition rather than letting you discover it. Uh, I have updated your translator module. You can now speak Amber. <laughs> so we've learned, how to, we've learned the language of the Amber. Um... Yep, and basically once you get the, the energy from Dark Aether, bring it back here. So this is actually... The, the game follows a very specific pace. So you access a new area, you visit the Light Temple. At the Light Temple, you, you gain a new color of translation. You meet the, you meet the priest. Um, the priest then sends you into the Dark World. You bounce back and forth between the dark world and the light world until you gather the three keys that will let you into the dark temple. You fight the boss of the dark temple, you get the energy, you bring it back to the light temple, and then you move on to the next area. Um, this talks about how awesome uh, planet Ether was for the Luminoth. Ether was a fertile, aged world with beautiful, bountiful fields and oceans, blah, blah, blah. It was absolutely fantastic. We... Um, Torvus was awesome, so was Aegon. We built a great temple. Uh, it was a time of harmony and wonderful, and we knew that nothing would ever, ever go wrong, like meteors filled with radioactive mystery elements that would destroy our planet and schism it into alternate dimensions that would invade us and steal all our energy. The end. <laughs> 